Moldova, a country in turmoil. This was the scene in March 2023. For months, people have taken to the streets in this small republic, which borders on Ukraine. Pro-Russian and pro-European protesters engage in angry standoffs. The war in Ukraine has polarized Moldovan society. Fears ran high right from the start of the war. Sheer panic. Folks were afraid it would start happening here, too. We didn't know what would happen next. Moldovans felt threatened. The word was their land was Putin's next target. The war is really close. Things could end badly. All the indications are there. How real is the fear that Moldova might lose its independence? Can this small country withstand the pressure from Russia? Russia's invasion of Ukraine on February the 24th, 2022, sparked fears in neighboring Moldova. Would they be next? The day after, the president went on TV. President Sandu, what's happening in our region? We have war in Ukraine and military activity near the border of the Republic of Moldova. It's a dramatic situation for our neighboring country. And for us, it's extremely threatening. The alarm was great, but so was the willingness to help. In an industrial area on the outskirts of the capital, Chisinau, we visit Anatoly de Cousa's company. The entrepreneur has been helping Ukrainian refugees ever since the war began. He set up a clothing depot in his factory following a visit to a border crossing on the very first day of the war. When we arrived there, I was shocked to see a woman dressed only in a nightgown with a blanket around her that had icicles hanging from it. It was snowing and freezing cold and in the middle of a field. I called up friends from my village of Koshnitsa. Lots of cars set off from there, and we brought the first 300 people there. But after four days, there was no more room. We housed them at our place, my mother's, and other relatives. Many in the village took in refugees. A few months after the war began, his firm started to suffer from the after-effects. By the fall of 2022, inflation was running at around 30%. His company makes machinery to process essential oil plants and has clients in Western Europe. We signed contracts and calculated our pricing before the pandemic. During the pandemic, prices rose, and the war has only made things worse. Metal and electricity cost twice as much now. We can no longer get by on our calculated budget. Life has also changed radically for IT expert and video blogger Vova Kamanov. When the war started, we stopped making music. Before we made and published music videos, my friends and I had a band, but we haven't sung since the 24th of February, 2022. <laughs> Now his music videos and travelogues seem like relics from a former life. Life was great before the war. Looking at this, I can hardly believe it. Why did this have to happen? I filmed travelogues in Moldova and abroad for ages, but since the war broke out, I've lost all desire to do that. Since then, Vova Kamanov has been more interested in the political situation in Moldova. 
I thought that Transnistria, the separatist region in Moldova, is a bit like the Donbass. I wanted to find out if there was a difference between these conflicts and whether it could lead to such hatred and war happening here. That's how this video came about. What is Transnistria? It's a region that broke away from Moldova in the 1990s. The international community says it belongs to Moldova, but Moldova has no control over it. In 1992, a war took place there. Russian troops have been stationed there ever since. All this makes Transnistria comparable to other hotspots in the former Soviet Union. The Donbass, Nagorno-Karabakh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Like other former Soviet republics, Moldova declared its independence in 1991. Moldova borders to the north, east and south on Ukraine, and to the west on Romania. This small country is also one of Europe's poorest. On the eastern side of the Dniester River lies the self-declared Pridnestrovian Moldavian Republic, better known as Transnistria. It's governed by separatists loyal to Moscow. In Chisinau, the Moldovan capital, pro-Russian governments wielded power for most of the last three decades. But now Moldova has a more EU-oriented head of state. In November 2020, Maya Sandu was elected president. Her most important campaign promise was to tackle corruption and poverty, two of the country's most pressing problems. But Sandu came to office in difficult circumstances. During this time, we've had to manage many crises. After the election of the new parliament and the forming of the government, we found ourselves confronted with an energy crisis due to rising natural gas prices. There are economic and social problems because this war has had several economic repercussions for the Republic of Moldova. There is great discontent in the population. Especially among people in rural areas who have been most affected by the war in Ukraine. The village of Tarasova, on the western bank of the Dniester, has been home to the Cherne family for generations. Elena Cherne and her siblings suffer from the poverty that's only getting worse here and the war is too close for comfort. Behind that hill, not far from here, is Ukraine. We were extremely concerned when the war started. We heard explosions in the distance. We were scared and had our suitcases packed and ready. We didn't know what would happen next. Yet even beforehand, life here wasn't always easy. Living in a divided country has an impact on their daily lives. When Elena Chene visits relatives on the other side of the river, she must go through a border control. The pensioner misses the old days, before the land and its people were separated. The village of Belochi on the opposite bank belongs to Transnistria. It's a Russian-speaking village. And nearby is Troyesht, a Moldovan village. That's how we lived, with one another. There was a lot of exchange across the river, even in the winter, over the ice. The ice was so thick that even cars could drive across it. In the summer, people went by boat. It all worked quite well.
But for the last 30 years, the river has served as a border which can only be traversed at specific crossings. On the Nista's eastern bank in the heart of the separatist region lie four villages which remain under Moldovan administration. Anatoly Dikosar comes from this area. When he visits his home village of Koshnitsa, he must pass a checkpoint staffed by so-called Russian peacekeepers. For us, the residents of these villages, it's annoying to have to drive through here slowly because sometimes they perform checks and harass people. The checkpoints should have been removed long ago. I think Koshnitsa is typical of the Republic of Moldova in that all the ethnic groups in our country are represented here. Many of the tradespeople in the village were ethnic Ukrainians, Russians, Jews, Gagaus, Kazakhs, or Azerbaijanis. To this day, we live with a variety of ethnic groups. This is Anatoly Dikosar's childhood home. When he was growing up here, Moldova still belonged to the Soviet Union. For as long as he can remember, language has been a source of conflict in his country. What language did you speak as a child? Moldovan. Now it's Romanian. Back then it was Moldovan. They wouldn't let us speak Moldovan. There were a lot of Russians at the factory. We weren't permitted to speak in our language. The Russians were always putting us down. What did they say? They called us vermin, alcoholics, dirty Moldovans. But the animosity goes beyond language. Poor economic conditions have also caused strife. Moldovans hoped independence would boost the economy and better their lives. But so far, they've reaped no benefits. People are hugely disappointed because we stumble from one crisis to the next. In the last 30 years, we haven't experienced any lengthy periods of stability or development. As a result, people no longer trust the government, no matter whether it's pro-European or pro-Russian. It's a total letdown. Many people in this area are pro-Russian leaning. I think they're being manipulated because they only watch Russian TV stations. I have no other explanation. There's disappointment and the propaganda simply works very well. How this disappointment and discontent could be instrumentalized became evident in September 2022. Then, busloads of people from across the country arrived in the capital to protest against the pro-European government. These demonstrations were financed by the pro-Russian opposition. A tent camp was set up in front of the parliament for the paid protesters so they could stay around the clock. On this afternoon, the crowd suddenly surged towards the entrance of the presidential palace. They demanded the resignation of President Maya Sandu. They chanted, we are the people. This must stop. We demand your resignation. Resign. The crowd parrots the pro-Russian propaganda that it's not the war that's driving inflation, but the Moldovan government. Since Maya Sandu came to power, we can barely survive. Prices have soared. I buy a bottle of kefir and some bread and live on that for three days. She should crawl to Putin on her knees, like a cockroach, and beg him for gas. Putin is really for the people. He wages war, but he doesn't kill any civilians. 
I'm for Russia and Putin because I can see that he does everything for the people. I've often been in Ukraine, and I haven't seen any acts of war. The war only takes place on TV and Facebook. Just how much outside influence is behind the protests? Moldova's president takes a clear stance. The protests we're experiencing today are organized by corrupt people who've stolen a lot from this country. They let our land become impoverished, then fled. And now they're using the poor by giving them a bit of the money they've stolen from them. Meanwhile, they're leading luxurious lives abroad and using people to destabilize the situation in this country. Like dubious politician Ilan Shaw, who's said to be funding the protests. Shaw is a thief. Maya Sandu is our president. Sure, don't forget, you belong in jail. I'm here to defend our government. These folks are paid to be here. They'd kill their own mother for cash. Moldovan society is deeply divided and the effects of the war are becoming increasingly evident in this far from wealthy country. Moldova was almost completely reliant on Russian gas, but Russia's largely state-owned firm Gazprom hiked prices while drastically reducing deliveries. Last fall, it threatened to cut off Moldova's gas supply altogether. Electricity was often in short supply too. Add to that the challenge of caring for the influx of Ukrainian refugees. Close to 100,000 of them have been living in Moldova for months, a huge number given Moldova's total population is just 2.6 million. The country lacks the resources to solve all these problems on its own. Which is also why Moldova applied to join the European Union shortly after Russia invaded Ukraine. In June 2022, Moldova was granted EU candidate status. And in the EU Parliament, Maya Sandu was lauded for her pro-European stance. This war was caused precisely by geopolitical designs to reshape the region, to divide it into spheres of influence, to seize territory. We support the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine as we always did. Crimea is Ukraine, Donbass is Ukraine, Kiev is Ukraine. Moldova is strongly determined to stay part of the free world. We are part of Europe. Yet, Moldova is still far from reaching European standards, especially in rural areas. To this day, the village of Tarasova has no running water. Elena Cherne has never known things any other way. During the drought this summer, there was hardly any water in the well. And if I take three or four buckets full, the neighbor will only be left with muddy water. That's how it is in the summer. The village does have a water station that pumps water out of the river for an industrial firm. Local residents were also supposed to have access to it. But only the neighboring village does, which is no coincidence. Our village of Tarasova remained without water. Then another mayor came and said we should collect funds to realize the project. I was the one who went to people and collected the money. A year later, still nothing had changed. I asked the mayor to return our money if it wasn't going to work. 
But he said the project was now completed and he couldn't give the money back. Elena Chernay's experience is no isolated case. Many such instances of corruption have made the people here bitter. While a few get rich, most Moldovans are growing poorer. Since gas prices have shot up, Elena Chernay cooks on the wood stove in her courtyard. Her pension is only around 100 euros a month, so she and her relatives must rely on themselves and each other to get by. We have children living abroad who help us with money. From that, we buy what we need. We couldn't survive a week on our pensions. They're thankful for the assistance, but miss their relatives. My son lives in the Czech Republic. My brother's in Moscow, my cousins too. My sister has a daughter. Yes, I have a daughter in Italy. She married someone there. We rarely see each other. That's life these days. People leave. The young people leave because there's no infrastructure. Nothing, absolutely nothing. <laughs> It's also this lack of prospects that angers people. The unrest in Chisinau went on for weeks. It was an open secret that people were being paid to protest, with set daily rates and a bonus for staying overnight. The police kept an eye on developments, but didn't intervene. These demonstrators support populist politician Ilan Shaw. He's been convicted of stealing a billion dollars from Moldovan banks. The money's vanished and Ilan Shaw has fled the country. He's been sentenced to 15 years in jail in absentia. And only a few passers-by dare to say this to the protesters. Why isn't Shaw here with you? He robbed three banks. I don't believe that. Since he entered politics, he's never forgotten the people. We elected Maya Sandu. Did the people elect her? Yes. The people are here. We agree with her. Only you? No, others too. Where are the others? They're working. You're not, yet you're being paid. 400 lei per day, 2,000 for the night. You know nothing. Why aren't you working? Because I'm here. Because the money's flowing. Where do such deep divisions come from? We noticed that in the tent camp, a screen was showing televised propaganda all the time. Ilan Shaw is omnipresent. The station TV6 is owned by one of his supporters and disseminates pro-Russian propaganda. The content is similar to what's shown to people in Transnistria. We're not allowed to film officially in this separatist territory. We're only allowed to visit as tourists for a maximum of 10 hours. So we're filming with a hidden camera. Tour guide Maxim Chumak lives and works in Transnistria. We contacted several tour guides, but he was the only one willing to show us around under the circumstances. Our media doesn't report about the protests in Chisinau. We have our own politics, our own president, the Supreme Soviet, our own power structures, from the justice system through to the executive. What happens on the other side of the river doesn't affect us. Transnistria is closer to Russia in spirit. Moldova is closer to Europe. Around 500,000 people live in this breakaway region, which is politically and economically reliant on Russia. Most of the people here also have Russian citizenship. Transnistria is sparsely populated, and people mainly live from farming.
Here, the Ukrainian border is never far away. You can see the border posts. This is the border strip between Transnistria and Ukraine. There are border patrols here, like in every country in the world. 1,500 Russian soldiers are stationed in Transnistria. We head for the Kobasna ammunition depot. It's thought to be one of the largest in Eastern Europe, housing an estimated 20,000 weapons. No one knows whether Russia plans to use them someday or against whom. It's a little place which is only known because of its ammunition depot that was built during the Soviet era. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, Transnistria inherited it. It's closely monitored by our Justice Department and Russian peacekeepers. A lot has been said about dismantling the depot. I don't think that's possible right now, without provoking people on one side of the river or the other. We can't solve the Transnistria conflict as long as the Russian military remains on the territory of the Republic of Moldova. We, the country's rightful institutions, have been demanding the withdrawal of Russian troops for decades. We also demand the destruction of the weapons stored in Kobasna, which pose a great danger, not just for the Republic of Moldova, but for the entire region. I wish Transnistria would become independent. Transnistria must become independent. Over the last 30 years, people's views have changed. The language is also an obstacle, because many people here don't speak any Romanian. Here, everyone speaks Russian. In 1992, the Transnistria War led to Transnistria breaking away from Moldova. Reminders of this time can still be found at the border to the separatist territory. In Koshnitsa, heavy fighting took place. With a Russian army and separatists loyal to Moscow on one side and those defending Moldova on the other. These are the traces that remain from those times. Guys drilled these holes for shooting. You can see the distance between them, around four meters, because there weren't so many soldiers. People were also stationed on the roof of the building. This was the village's center of defense. What's happening in Ukraine now is familiar to me. Back then we had had lots of refugees who fled to Chisinau or Romania. I can well remember people's terror and fear. What's happening now affects me quite deeply. Anatoly Dikosar's cousin took part in the fighting back then. The separatists approached the village and shot into the air with their machine guns to frighten the residents. The next day we went to the police station and they gave us four machine guns because we had nothing. We used these weapons to mount our defense. The police sent in reinforcements from Chisinau and that's how we were able to hold off the separatists and not let them into our village. In 1992, the armed forces of the young Republic of Moldova consisted of novice soldiers and volunteers. For the older generation, the memory of these dramatic times is still vivid. The first time I went to the front line to bring food, I got to know a policeman. He accompanied me. No one else would go there. I said, I'm not afraid. 
When we arrived there, the boys were sitting in the trenches, making fire from tree branches and drying their clothes and socks. You couldn't feel anything but pity for those poor boys sitting there. How could I not bring them dinner? One night, a lot of separatists came with machine guns. They fired the whole time. There was so much blood that it flowed down the street. The Transnistria war was short and bloody. Kosnitsa remained Moldovan. Transnistria broke away and oriented itself towards Russia. The ceasefire agreement has held since it was signed on July the 21st, 1992. But some 30 years on, war once again threatens Moldova's fragile peace. Just how much the war in Ukraine affects Moldova became clear when Russia announced a partial mobilization of military reservists in September 2022. That meant young Moldovan men with Russian citizenship could be drafted. Deserters. That's what my acquaintances from Russia are now being called. Even those with Moldovan citizenship had a hard time leaving Russia. There were long lines. Their dual citizenship didn't exempt them from mobilization. They were very nervous. Hundreds of thousands of men deemed fit for military service left Russia for fear of being called up. Most fled to neighboring countries, to Kazakhstan, Armenia or Georgia. Vova Kamanov documented the exodus for his blog. A day before the mobilization took effect, I was at the only border checkpoint between Russia and Georgia, where there was a lot of activity. I spoke with people there and later with a few Russians who made it to Tbilisi. That's what this video is about. That's the scene at the border. Russian mobilization also created a potentially volatile situation for the Republic of Moldova, especially where Transnistria is concerned. There is the danger of a mobilization of Moldovan citizens in the country's eastern districts. To prevent such actions, we're examining the possibility of revoking the Moldovan citizenship of those who hold citizenship of both the Republic of Moldova and the Russian Federation and who fight on the side of the aggressor. I don't know exactly what the leaders of Russia and other countries are after, but these conflicts are very similar. It's no coincidence that we've all been divided – Moldova, Georgia, Ukraine, Azerbaijan and Armenia. For Vova Kamanov, the idea that Russia is systematically dividing these post-Soviet societies is as obvious as it is disconcerting. In October 2022, the war in Ukraine came even closer to Moldova. Parts from a Russian missile fired at Ukraine landed in a Moldovan village near the border. The blast waves burst windows in several houses here in northern Moldova, but no one was injured. Ukraine's anti-aircraft system had shot down the Russian missile. President Sandu came to see the situation for herself. The missile came from Ukraine. What's Russia got to do with it? We need to differentiate between who's supporting the war and who isn't. We won't support the war. Why is power four times cheaper in Ukraine? Ukraine has no electricity. 
In Kyiv and other cities, there's no light, no water, no heat. In the winter, the Moldovan government will provide compensation for heating costs. Not for everyone. Why not? Last year it was paid and this year it'll be even more. People get that, but we're suffering. This winter will be tough due to the war, because prices have risen due to the war. We're a small country and we need to stick together in these tough times. We can do it. Thank you. Meanwhile, the tent camp in front of the parliament has been cleared by the police. But the problems won't be swept away so easily. In November 2022, the energy crisis grew worse. Following massive Russian attacks on the Ukrainian power system, Moldova was also experiencing electricity shortages and blackouts. Only thanks to financial support from the international community could the Moldovan state compensate pensioners and low-income earners for the winter's high energy costs. Still, life remained a struggle for most. Entrepreneur Anatoly de Kossar had to suspend production at his company. Heating and energy costs were too high, and the order situation was too uncertain. We're in a kind of hibernation. At the moment, there's no progress, nothing. We're all waiting for something, but we just don't know what. There's no stability as far as our business goes. We have a few contracts, but they're on hold because people are waiting to see what happens. Hardly any investments are being made. It's a big problem and means we can't develop. Despite the bleak economic situation, Anatoly de Kossar still supports Ukrainian refugees. But for how much longer? He too needs to see some light at the end of the tunnel. In February 2023, Moldova's stability looked to be increasingly threatened. President Maya Sandu revealed details of an alleged Russian plot to overthrow her pro-European government. She was alerted to the planned coup by Ukraine, which said it had intercepted Russian intelligence. The plan included sabotage and militarily trained people disguised as civilians to carry out violent actions, attacks on government buildings, and taking hostages. Through violent actions disguised as protests by the so-called opposition, the change of power in Chisinau would be forced. In March 2023, a new wave of pro-Russian street protests began. This time, the issue was Moldova's official language and what it's named. Parliament voted that it should no longer be called Moldovan, as it was during Soviet times, but rather Romanian. It was another step taken by Parliament's pro-European majority to distance itself from Moldova's Soviet legacy, and with it, from Russia too. Vova Kamanov observes the protests in the capital with concern. The situation in the country is worrying. The languages were always at the forefront. They're a source of irritation. The war is really close. Things could end badly. All the indications are there. If someone is aiming to aggravate the situation, it's already escalated. I'm quite concerned to see this.
Romanian is our only language. We're Moldovans. Moldovan language. Traitors! Our language is Romanian. Moldovan. This shows the polarization and how nerves are frayed. My conviction that Moldova will be drawn more deeply into the conflict has grown this year. At the start of the war, the fear was great. Since then, we've unfortunately grown used to the war. Now I'm calmly talking about the fact that something could happen here. Is Russia really working to promote conflict in Moldova in the hopes of bringing down its pro-European government? Reports about a Kremlin strategy paper containing a concrete action plan to destabilize Moldova assert just that. We're not threatened with military aggression today. But precisely because Russia cannot reach our borders, the Kremlin is waging a hybrid war against the Republic of Moldova. At the same time, good things are also happening. We've managed to make it through the winter, despite Gazprom's blackmail, despite the fact that prices were very high, despite the destabilization attempts and, let's call a spade a spade, despite Russia's attempts to bring down a democratically elected government. I want everyone to understand our only route to prosperity, peace, freedom and stability is membership in the European Union. But Moldova's eventual accession to the EU is still far off. And since the war in Ukraine began, it's become clear that Russia isn't prepared to stop exerting its influence on this small republic. Moldova will be fighting for its future for a long while to come.